I should not be here tonight. My destiny was to be dead by the time I was 21 years old or to do life in prison without parole. You see, I was born in the barrio, the barrio, the hood of East Los Angeles, and I was born into poverty. As a child, I slept on a smelly mattress on a concrete floor in a musty basement, or at nighttime you hear the sounds of mousetraps popping, or I'd be woken at midnight or such by the scratches of the little feet across my arm, my back, and my face because the house was infested with mice, rats, and roaches. My father was in and out of jail, and he wasn't in jail, he was robbing people because he needed money to buy the drugs to put the needles in his arm because he liked the drugs more than he liked his family. My father was a heroin addict and an alcoholic. At the age of three, he left our family and the only legacy he left us was a pile of bills and a bunch of empty bottles of booze in the trash can. But my mother, she worked two, three jobs to make sure her little boy and little girl didn't go to bed hungry and they would not become part of a system. At the age of six, I almost died. They sent me to a school for the physically disabled and the mentally challenged because I could not walk, talk, or read or write. But after three painful years of rehabilitation, I walked out of that school tall and strong and on my own. At the age of nine, my mother remarries. And the nightmare starts all over again because she marries an abusive drunk. He used to come home from work late after the bars and pull me out of my room and start beating on me until I'm black and blue and I was just a little dude. What are you going to do? And to add insult to injury, he used to beat up on my mom. And there were times where he left her bloody and battered. I'm going to come back to that later. I got old enough, I ran away. And I started running and gunning, stealing and dealing. Did I rob houses? Yes. Did I steal cars? Yes. Did I do drugs? Yes. Did I sell drugs? Yes. Had I become my father's son? Shamefully, yes. Am I proud of myself? Absolutely not. And I know some of you know what I'm about to say, that guilt is a heavy burden for you to carry around for the rest of your life. So the next few years of my life, I ran around like a dog chasing his tail in circles, looking for love in all the wrong places. And I found a new dysfunctional family called gangs. At the age of 17, I get a call of my biological father. My father dies in a halfway house on Skid Row. Skid Row in Los Angeles, where the hobos live. My father died a bum, a heroin addict and an alcoholic. So I wanted to see where he lived because I spent my whole life wondering why my dad didn't love me. But when I got there, I realized that it wasn't that he didn't love me, he didn't love himself. So I gave the death certificate to the lady at the front desk and they gave me a key. They said, room 66. So as I'm walking through the hallway of the flickering lights, it was stale smelling, it smelled like urine. And there was prostitutes and pimps and derelicts and alcoholics reaching out to me, asking me for money, saying, give me money, give me money. And I start to shake, I'm nervous. And I get to the door and I put the key and I finally got it in there and I turned the doorknob and I opened it real slow and I stood there. And it was like deja vu. My dad had left again, the same way he had left me when I was only three, it was more empty bottles of booze in the trash can. A lot of people think that you can control drugs and control alcohol, but I'm here to tell you, they'll always take control of you no matter what. And my father's death proved to me that if you play with the devil, if you play with the devil, you're gonna get burned. And I got burned because I was still playing with the devil. Hell, I was sleeping with the devil. And I made a drug deal that went bad. I delivered the drugs to some guy's house. He took a knife, tasted it, it was cocaine. He reaches in, which I thought was gonna give me a big wad of money, but he pulls out a gun. And he points it at my face, he says, say good night, and he pulls the trigger twice. And by the grace of God, it was a misfire. So I tackle the guy to the floor and I start beating on the guy. I get up and I run out the side door, but it was glass and I come tumbling on the other side, bleeding profusely, I had cuts and glass all over my body. And I'm running down the street saying, God, if you let me live, I'll sin no more. But where am I gonna go? I don't know anybody and all my friends are losers. So what I did was I joined the military and the military was the best decision of my life because not only it changed my life, but it saved my life. And not only made me a man, but it made me a better man. And I traveled all over the world, jumping out of helicopters and airplanes. I learned about duty, honor, country. And I learned about a word called character. Character is not just doing this right when somebody's watching you, it's doing the right thing when nobody's watching you. So, 
after I honorably served our country for over seven years, three months, eight days, 14 hours and about 13 minutes, I went home because I was ready to be a leader and a man. And guess what happened? My same so-called friends, my peeps, my homeboys had elevated their game to dealing heavy drugs. Some of them got smoke and dusted and gang violence and drug violence. And those were a hard time in a federal penitentiary doing 25 to life. You know, when I went home, they called me a punk and a sellout because I wouldn't run with these guys anymore, which proves that misery loves company, right? So I decided to leave again. Because sometimes to get away and make a change, you got to leave. So I came just down the street to a friend who lived in Lyle. He had a one bedroom apartment said I could stay there. So he said, you got to sleep on the floor. I said, that's not my first time on cool. So I put blankets and pillows on the floor. And all I could afford to eat back then was Arby sandwiches five for five. Remember those? <laughs> all right. Well, you know, I'd have half a sandwich in the morning, half a sandwich at night on a Monday, made the four sandwiches last throughout the week, drank a lot of water, lost a lot of weight. But I said, I want to be somebody. And I got a job in the commercial laundry industry selling washers and dryers. That's how I started. And I worked every day, every holiday, every weekend. I didn't see my mom for five years. And while others were going to Lake Michigan or the ball game or taking their girlfriend out to eat or walking their little doggy named Sparky, I was working. And I'm proud to say that after five years, I got recruited and I became vice president of a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. So I climbed the ladder of corporate America for six years, and I was having dinner one night, and I said, you know, I want to have a shot. And I didn't mean like a shot of a gun or a shot of tequila, brandy, or bourbon. I said, I want to take a shot and start my own business. And I started my own business, and after three years, we became the number one distribution company in the United States. And I thought I had arrived, right? I was sleeping on the floor. I have a house on a pond. I used to walk everywhere, ride a bike, or take a bus. I had a Mercedes Benz. Nice clothes, few bucks in the bank, flying first class. And I share that with you, not to impress you at all, but to empower you. Because I learned that the two greatest days in your life are the day you're born and the day you realize why you're born. And I wanted to give back. I wanted to make sure people didn't end up like my dad. People didn't end up like me making bad choices, almost dying. I wanted to teach people that the greater the struggle, the greater the victory, that your pain, my pain, our pain is not in vain. So I wrote a book. The book's called From the Barrio to the Boardroom. Right? And that book came out screaming because I got a call shortly after from Arnie Duncan, who's still here in 2008, Secretary of Education. They said, we want to teach this book. So a curriculum was created for the book that addresses, was called Social and Emotional Learning. I paid to have the curriculum done, and I donate that curriculum to schools across the country and around the world. So if you're in education, you talk, we got to make this happen. We got to help save these kids. So later that year, I get a call from a group called RFBND. Recording for the blind and dyslexic. And they said, Robert, we want to turn your book into a CD to help kids that are visually impaired have reading disabilities. So they launched it nationally, and it helps over 236,000 kids around the United States. Thank you. <laughs> the next year, if you can picture this, the kids are telling me they're reading my book to their parents. And I said, well, don't your parents read? They say they don't read English. So we translate the book into Spanish. And then the churches got a hold of me and they said, hey, we see the kids in the hood with your book, but we can't get them to church. We want to use your book as a hook to get them into Bible study, to lead them to Christ so our kids can see the promised land, I was told. So we have a faith-based curriculum now and we donate that to all the ministries around the world who work with kids. So if you're in ministries, let's talk. Right, so I spent the first couple of years in middle schools, high schools, colleges, higher education, youth prisons, jails, social services, homeless shelter, better women's shelters, but I wasn't getting to the elementary school kids. See, the book from the barrio is taught mostly middle school and up. And the reason it's important to get to the little kids is because the gangs, they prey on your kids. And they try to recruit them. And it goes down something like this. Hey, come here. I got something for you. Want to make some money? Nice and easy, right? I got your back. All you got to do is deliver this to that guy named Joey over there and tell him Big Papa sent you. And they, they bait these kids. So I said, okay, if I can create a tool to cut the umbilical cord to the gang recruitment. So I came up with an idea to release a graphic novel called Mi Barrio. My Barrio, My Hood. And Mi Barrio was voted the best graphic novel in 2011 for Latin America, Spain, and the United States of America addressing youth issues. So now we're working with kids third grade and people older than us. 
So I wanted to get to the pre-K, K-1 and 2, so we went back to the drawing board and we released an activity coloring book called Little Barrio. So I'm proud to say that over the last 12 years, $350,000 later that I don't have anymore because I saw funded, but that's okay because it's built, we have developed a comprehensive, bilingual, non-generic book series and program that is culturally relevant that resonates with the youth and promotes student achievement. I'm also proud to say those books are being taught in classrooms across America to students and now in 25 other countries around the world. But I wanted to do more because it does take a village to save and raise a child. I said, listen, I got together with a choreographer from Gloria Stefan, and they said, let's do a play. So we got together with After School Matters and the Miracle Center, these kids right here who performed and produced in my play, right? 30 inner city kids whose lives transformed over a year, right? They told me when that play was over that their boardroom is now the theater. And I'm gonna share with you a clip of that play. I have been knifed, shot at, and beat up more times than I can care to discuss. But I gave back more than my fair share as well. My fights, however, were never because I wanted to hurt anyone or be malicious. I always fought to protect myself, and shamefully carrying guns and knives was the way things worked. Plenty of times I was involved in circumstances that could have easily found me six feet under. It doesn't matter if you're careful or not. It all eventually catches up with you. That play was performed in Chicago last year to sold out crowds. And if you look at the eyes, the eyes of those kids, what I see, and I hope you see, is I see hope and I see dreams. I see possibilities waiting to happen. I see the future leaders of our country because that's what they represent. And I was blessed to be able to watch these kids spread their wings and fly like the angels God intended them to be. So I said, I have to reach more kids, younger kids. So I had an idea for a cartoon. Given all the violence, I said, it's gotta be about conflict resolution. How to settle our differences without hurting each other. So we put together a teaser for a cartoon called Kid Barrio. You're probably saying, Robert, this is really good stuff, you know, we really need to save our children. But what are the kids saying? So I'm glad you asked. I think it's very, like a very inspirational story. Comparing my life to his life, I have it much easier and I thought that maybe I could achieve that, my goals. He, how he says that even when you have a corazón and the heart that, you know, you can still keep on going. My parents didn't go to college so it's making me want to succeed more. So like, I want to be more, I want to do better. It inspired me to try harder in school, like nothing's gonna stop you, it's up to you to accomplish what you want in life. You know, the question now is what's next? And what's next is a big idea whose time has come to bring relevant tools that are working to help stop the bullying, gangs, violence, drugs, school dropouts, and that crap called racism. So we're talking about partnering. Recently we partnered with the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts of America. We've partnered with the Library of Congress. We've partnered with the WBC, the World Boxing Council, who mentors boys and girls ages eight to, eight, eight to 18 in 165 countries around the world. And we're here to partner with you. You can't be part of a solution unless you're part of the process. The books from the barrio to the boardroom teach our kids that the ultimate weapon is not a loaded gun, but an educated mind. And the books teach our boys and our men that there's no excuse for violence and you especially do not put your hands on a woman. Because you see, women are not just beautiful and smart, but women are the greatest gifts that God ever created in this lifetime. Ladies, am I right, am I right? <laughs> Listen, the Barrio program is a blueprint for success hard work, determination, and education. 
you have to get involved. You have to get involved because if you don't, you're going to realize when it's too late that the most valuable property on the planet is the graveyard. Yeah, the graveyard. Because in the gra graveyard, there's hopes and dreams and aspirations, ideas and inventions that we'll know, never know about, that will never be realized. So I have a challenge for you tonight. Those of you who've been there and done that, you know the score. I want to ask you, please, to accept this challenge. I want you to tell your story. I want you to tell your story so that we can all be healed.